Uh, joined on the panel on Thirsty Thursday, as always, Mr. Michael Lefton Fox in the chat room. Hello. Hello. And also, hey also we have back from his um, Orlando vacation, <laughs> Mr. Brian. Brian Walken. Hey, guys. How you doing? And we have the man that's been sending his snow down here to eastern <laughs> Pennsylvania, Mr. Oh, – I'm sorry, western Pennsylvania, Mr. Ubuntu himself from Category 5 Technology TV, Mr. Robbie Ferguson. Robbie, welcome to the show. So he runs he runs Ubuntu, and uh, actually prior to you coming on, me, Fox, we were, we were discussing uh, that the problems that uh, – He's gotten questions about with 9.10, and uh, I don't know what what are your thoughts on uh, Ubuntu's release of 9.10. I know a lot of people were a little skeptical when it came out. I was just going to say, I think some of the skeptics. I mean, we've had some some people that have referred to Ubuntu uh, 9.10 as being very resource intensive and just different than previous distros. Again, I mean, I don't I don't have a very extensive Linux background. I mean, I, I'm certainly not going to pretend like I do, but you know, just in hanging out in here for a while, that's some of the uh, some of the complaints that have come up. So. That's interesting. I think that um, I guess it depends on what you're using it for and what you want to do. But the the whole nature of Linux and open source software is is that it's customizable. You look at the Windows operating system as an exa- as a perfect example that it's it's very difficult to out of the box customize the operating system to a level that you're comfortable with. It's true that Ubuntu out of the box has become what they intended to be, which is to be a very sleek very attractive and very um, feature-rich desktop operating system straight from the installation. But if that's more richness, if that's more features and fancy effects than, than you want to have running on your system, then there's always the option to remove those features. And that's one of the beautiful things about a Linux-driven operating system is that it's customizable. What kind of first-time problems am I going to experience with Linux? Uh, what are some of the challenges that may await me? And... Uh, your start menu is at the top. Yeah, well, that, was, that was one that you were saying before. Uh, but what, what about any incompatibilities? Uh, I know we did talk about, you know, uh, Fox was saying about Photoshop uh, not being on there. But there is there is other programs like GIMP that are out there that are open source that you can use. But um, mm-hmm. what are some of the things that uh, I'm going to face as a new user that wants to play around with Linux? I think uh, basically what it comes down to is, what you, again, what you're going to be using the system for. Uh, if it's software, you mentioned Photoshop. So if it's software that you're that you're contending against, if that's what's holding you back, or if that's what you expect, then there there's really a, a few different options. The the first option, of course, is to find an alternative piece of software, like go to osalt.com, uh, find an open source alternative to what it is that you're using. A lot of times that's effective. For example, if you're used to using Microsoft Word, it's very easy to transition into Open Office Writer. Very similar applications. It's able to uh, open and save to your doc format, things like that. So those kinds of transitions, while it's a different piece of software, it's not too too difficult to get into. On the other hand, if you're using something like Photoshop, if you're in one of the, you know, like CS4, which is not necessarily able to run under Wine, which is uh, the ability to run Windows applications within Linux, if you're using that piece of software to transition to something like the GIMP, which is GNU Image Manipulation Program, that transition is a lot larger than the transition from Word to OpenOffice, using that example. So if finding an alternative piece of software is not the option for you, uh, and using Photoshop as that example, because it's a, it's a good example, a lot of people use it, um, then there are options such as dual booting, which is to reboot your computer into Windows whenever you want to access your program. That's not ideal because you do have to do the reboot procedure, but where that comes in really handy is if, let's say, you've got some Windows video games uh, that utilize specific hardware. Say you're into race car games and you've got the steering wheel with the force feedback and all that kind of stuff. Then emulation or virtualization is not an option because you need to have all the resources natively uh, available to your Windows operating system. So dual booting in that case is ideal. gives you the chance to boot into Linux and have that virus-free... Uh, super speedy, super sexy uh, interface and not have to deal with the viruses and things like that. But then if you need the Windows uh, applications, you can reboot and have access to that. But then the next thing that you can do is, uh, in that transitional uh, process, is use what's called virtualization, which 
Uh, for example, Sun VirtualBox is available as a free download. You can get the open source edition in the repositories. Uh, we had Fox mentioning Synaptic Package Manager there and uh, apt-get. Uh, that'll, that's an installer for Linux that allows you to install programs for free without the need for disks or anything like that. You just type in the name of the software and it just installs it on your computer for you. Um, so VirtualBox is one way to do it. VirtualBox will let you install Windows or uh, many different operating systems into your host operating system. So if you're running Ubuntu or Linux, uh, you're able to install, say, Windows XP or Windows 7 into a virtual machine. So it actually comes up inside uh, Ubuntu Linux. So then you're able to run your Photoshop. You're able to run your QuickBooks. And any of the applications that you can't natively run on Linux are now available to you through virtualization. And then taking it one step further, you've got uh, seamless mode and integration like that where these applications become seamlessly integrated into your Linux desktop so that it looks like it's actually running natively on your, on your Linux desktop. Hmm. So that's kind of from a software standpoint, Steve, uh, going back a little bit, kind of what, what can happen. People in the chat room mentioning, don't forget about Wine. Uh, Wine is uh, a Windows uh, API application layer. Uh, that allows you to run Windows applications just by clicking on the .exe files. But it's not, it's not perfect as far as being able to run everything, uh, but you can get a lot of applications to run natively in Linux using Wine, uh, which is also, again, free software. So you can install that from the repositories and then be able to run a lot of your, Linux, uh, a lot of your Windows applications directly within Linux. No rebooting, no having to boot up a virtual machine. Uh, but it doesn't work with everything. I use CS4 as the example. Hmm. Um, so away from software, if that, if that kind of covers that for you, Steve. Yeah. Beyond that, um, looking at hardware, what you can expect, Steve, would be just making sure that your, your system is going to be compatible with, with uh, you know, drivers and things like that. What's interesting about Linux, though, is unlike uh, you're used to if, you, if you've used Windows XP or uh, even some uh, with Windows Vista especially and, and even into Windows 7, you'll find that after you uh, install the operating system, there are certain pieces of hardware that you need to install the drivers for. You need to find the driver's disk for your printer. You need to uh, install your Wi-Fi card. You need to, to do all those things before you've got a working system. With XP, it was horrendous, where you'd have to get your network drivers before you could access the Internet, but you can't get on the Internet to get your drivers, so we've got a Catch-22 situation where, you know, well, if you don't have the CD, then you're messed, you know? Right, so, right. Um, good situation as an example to where that can become a problem is my wife's laptop. Uh, my daughter, when she was about two years old, ripped the CD drive out of that computer. Oh. So she didn't have access to inserting the CD for, the, for her Wi-Fi uh, network card. Oh, man. Uh, so when it came to reinstalling the operating system at this point, we didn't have the CD drive. We couldn't get access to, um, to the network because it's not available yeah, because the driver do not exist. Catch-22. Right, right. So for those, if, if, anyone, if anyone ever encounters that, what I ended up having to do was take the hard drive out of the laptop and install the drivers uh, through a connector. So, um, but what's interesting about Linux, and we're seeing this more and more with, and, and I think Mac OS is pretty similar, but that's a little different because it's proprietary hardware. So, of course, they can get away with including the drivers. Mm -hmm. With Windows 7, we're starting to see things come together. Windows is finally starting to get their act together, Microsoft is, and create an operating system that's a little more intuitive than it was back in the XP days, but it's still not seamless. Uh, with Linux, you find that as you install the, the, the system, uh, even booting from a live CD, it's going to detect all your hardware and it's just going to work. You don't need to go through the driver installation procedure. Mm -hmm. If you have a wireless adapter, you may encounter issues with uh, with that uh, in Linux, and that's because a lot of Wi-Fi card manufacturers don't uh, open the source of their, of their drivers. However, there are uh, a lot of initiatives uh, on the Internet uh, that are a part of the open source community that develop uh, non, I guess what you call, like drivers that are not manufactured by the manufacturer of the card, but they are native drivers for that card. So mm -hmm. with Wi-Fi in Linux... You may have to go through the process of installing the drivers, which has become progressively easier and easier uh, with uh, subsequent releases of Ubuntu.